Hello, everyone. Welcome to our AI talk at ETUI. And this is Aida Ponce del Castillo, and I'm going to be your host. Today, I have the great, great pleasure to um, invite a um, couple of great uh, researchers and uh, activists, if I may, because uh, if you have noticed, Last, the last week, we launched the ETUR report, Exercise and Workers' Rights in Algorithmic Management Systems. We have, or oh, the authors have um, explained the lessons learned from a technical investigation um, carried out in a global Fodinho digital labor platform through uh, the app of a, of, a, of a rider. And for that, we have our special guests. On the one hand, Claudio Agosti, who is an algorithm analyst. He is the founder of Tracking Expose, the company who did the, the invest technical investigation in this very particular mobile app. And now he is doing research and development at Hermes Center, AI Forensics. And he also is the founder of Reversing Works. His work, uh, his technical and, and research work, supports trade unions in exposing surveillance and discrimination practices of platform workers. Claudio is also exploring new concepts between technology and society. And then we also have Joanna Voronovichka, who is a sociologist at the Center for Interdisciplinary Labor Law Studies at the University, European University of Piadrina. She researches how platform workers mobilize from their rights within the broader labor movement in Berlin. And currently he's working in a law gender collectivi collectivity project, developing, developing a feminist perspective on the idea of collectivity embedded in the law. So uh, to start this fantastic AI talk, let's kick, our, let's kick start our session first. I'll turn to Joanna to explain us a little bit about the implication of this uh, case and then to Claudio. Joanna, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Aida, uh, for organizing this event and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, before I uh, dig deeper into the details of the Glovo Fudinho case and this Italian uh, data protection authority decision and investigations that were really a landmark in this field of uh, data protection in the workplace. Let me um, start with a little introduction, some general remarks that are perhaps a little obvious, but I think important here. I think I make a safe assumption here that everybody joining us today is a worker. Sure, we represent different professions and ways of working, but we all work in one way or another. And I will make another safe bet that we all use phones and computers for our work. Um, and some of us perhaps use private devices for work, at least sometimes. Maybe even today you're connecting from a personal device. Maybe you took out your phone on the way to work and you liked some pictures on the Instagram and then remember to check your work phone, work email. And, and maybe you just use your phone to order lunch and maybe you're even listening to the Zoom call on, uh, on your private phone. So now let me ask you, where did you do all these things? You were probably at home, maybe you took your usual route to work, then you were in your office, then maybe you went to one of your favorite restaurants. And it is very likely that throughout this time uh, that you were doing this, there were apps running on your phone in the background that you just forgot to close um, that were recording your location. And this location data is very precious, especially if you're combining it with other types of data about your preferences and behaviors. And this data is likely to be the raw material for some kind of artificial intelligence system that is being developed right now. So I'm, I'm talking about this because often when we talk about artificial intelligence in the workplace, we, we talk about artificial intelligence as if it was made in some secret location uh, by big tech uh, or governments, maybe something like Los, Am Los Alamos of our times, something that will revolutionize the future and probably for others, but not for us. But... Uh, the reality is that um, the AI labs uh, are in our pockets and we are working for them by providing the raw data to train these systems. 
So in fact, from the perspective of the app providers, there is no difference between our private and working lives. Uh, we check Instagram on our work time, whether our employers know about this or not. And most importantly, we sometimes use work apps during our private time. So technically speaking, the data about our behavior from both our working and private lives is already being combined into one profile and sold to advertisers. Legally, at least in the European Union, that should not be done. This is illegal, but whether these data protection laws are being enforced and how is another question. So the starting point for today is this blurring between private and working lives that is facilitated by the mobile apps on our phones. It is clearly a challenge for uh, our data protection uh, and privacy, but, and this is what we will be talking about today, is also an opportunity. Because paradoxically, by encouraging users to install on their private phones, uh, these, company, these companies make it easier for us to see what's happening inside. Um, so if we were to conduct an audit of a, an app on a computer phone or on a, on a com company's phone or company's um, a computer, we would probably need to ask them for permission. But if it's installed in our private phone, we can really take a look what's going on inside without having to take to ask anybody. And that is that is and that was the basic promise of our study into the global app that Claudio will talk about uh, later in detail. But that was also the premise of the decision why the Italian DPA um, realized that apps are the problem and an opportunity for strategic enforcement. So the head of the Italian DPA in 2019 um, the Italian DPA is sometimes called uh, Garante also, and he said that a new global privacy emergency is called uh, the app economy. So he was really re resolved to look at the apps and, you know, working apps are a very interesting case study because often they require workers to participate in the data collection. The workers have to swipe when they, um, the platform workers have to swipe when they receive an order, when they deliver an order. Um, and uh, their working process really requires the location to be uh, monitored quite closely. So the DPA uh, decided to take a closer look at Glovo. And what resulted uh, was not only a landmark decisions, but what I will argue also um, a landmark investigation. Why do I say landmark investigations? Because it's also the way that they went about studying um, that is an interesting lesson here. So first of all, uh, the Italian Data Protection Authority decided to start this uh, investigation ex officio. Usually the DPAs uh, react to complaints uh, submitted to by submitted to the authority by the data subjects, or sometimes they have a procedure in this case in Italy it's called signalazione, which means that any interested party can also notify the DPA that something um, might be off. Um, so I think that uh, the fact that the Italian DPA started this case ex officio because they it really fit into their strategic priorities shows that uh, DPAs can be proactive and strategic about enforcement and that maybe other, um, other DPAs in Europe could also uh, make more of a priority of identifying these in, in interesting or impactful cases. Now, second thing that was very interesting is that uh, Italian DPA had to cooperate with Spain in this case. So Spain already in June 2020 uh, ordered a fine of Glovo of 25,000 euros, uh, but only for the fact that they didn't have a data protection officer. And um, the Italians had to really ask Spain if they could uh, take a look at this case. And Spain said, OK. Uh, you can take a look at this case because there is an employment relationship between uh, workers and Glovo or Fudinho in, in Italy. And the fact that this employment relationship exists in Italy would be a basis for you to, to, to take a look at this case. I think this in interpretation is very important. I don't know, but I wonder if other DPAs would also see it like that. 
uh, because that would mean that investigations could be carried out not only where there is headquarters, but where is the employment relationship. Now, the third reason why it was very interesting was that they did an inspection in person, which means that they came to the office of uh, Fudino without a prior notice and looked in real life, in real time, um, at the computer interfaces, and in particular at the interface called the admin platform. And they were able to see that with one click, with a drop down menu that choose a country, you can see, um, you know, where the riders are, not only in Italy, but in other European Union countries and, uh, and even beyond uh, Europe. So from my knowledge, this kind of in-person inspections are very rare, but if the DPAs did them more often, I think that would be, uh, that would be quite impactful because uh, not only they would see more than what the companies provide in documents when they're asked to, pro to explain how these algorithmic management systems work, but also because, uh, you know, companies would start caring, fearing maybe that uh, such an inspection is about to, to happen. So I think um, this was this is a better method than uh, only close scrutiny of the documents provided of the company, because often these companies provide documents that are contradictory or misleading. And that was also the case um, here. Um, so I think that... Um, the, this decision was very, very interesting. I don't know what resources exactly Garante had, what kind of technical and legal experts, but uh, certainly good ones because it resulted with a 44 page detailed decision uh, that is really a model and I hope that they share their practices with other DPAs in, in Europe. Now, why was this decision a landmark decision? Well, um, the, the DPA identify multiple violations of the GDPR, um, uh, and specifically not only the lack of uh, DPO and DPO contact, but uh, the fact that the privacy policy was too vague. It really didn't inform the writers properly about um, the extent and the purpose of the data processing. But also, you know, they discovered that the amount of data that this uh, company was collecting about riders and their working process was just uh, enormous and that they kept this data for a very long time and that it was prone to leaks because cybersecurity was installed once and never really updated. But of course, the most important thing here is that it was the first time that the Data Protection Authority um, sanctioned a company uh, according to Article 22 of the GDPR, the one that prohibits automated processing of data. So the DPA, that was done previously by courts, by court in Amsterdam, but in this case, it was an administrative um, body and uh, the DPA identified that there was a fully automated system, in this case called the excellence system, which basically based on performance of riders, um, gave them orders. So riders with better excellence score got better orders and the ones that had lower excellence scores had worse order. And um, the DPA decided that there was no humans involved in making these decisions and that the riders had no choice but to accept or reject them. So there was no sufficient safeguards for the rights, of, uh, rights and freedoms of the riders and they had no right to obtain human intervention. So Glovo of course tried to deny that these system existed altogether but the evidence that the DPA collected was sufficient to say that, yes, uh, there was an automated decision-making system and therefore Article 22 applies. And this has two important consequences. This means that the company should have conducted a data protection impact assessment and they didn't. And uh, I think that's also a lesson for us that as, uh, as workers or as activists, we can... Um, ask companies, have they done the DPAs? And even if they say no, then we can ask the data protection authorities uh, to check if uh, such a DPA I, uh, D, uh, was submitted. Uh, and also this was important because that means that, you know, uh, the Italian data protection authority really took seriously their job of implementing data protection laws and, um, and, and, and employment laws 
jointly, which uh, which is different in every European Union country. But in this case, um, they showed that uh, that um, data protection laws and labor laws apply jointly. That employment relation really exists. So, um, so I think that was uh, that was very interesting. Uh, not, and finally, last not but the least, they gave the fine for uh, for Glovo of two point six million euros. So a lot more than the Spanish DPA of 25,000 euros. Glovo tried to challenge this fine and uh, got the tribunal in Milan actually overturned it. But the Supreme Court agreed with the DPA, so the fine stands and hopefully will encourage other companies also to uh, take a closer look at how they protect data and privacy of workers. So I will now turn over to Claude. Claudio. Yes. But Thank you, thank you, Joanna. So we understand the the relevance, the legal relevance of this case um, for labor law, but also for privacy and data protection. It's a, a combination of of both, uh, but it's I think it's also a landmark case because it is the first time, if I am not mistaken, that we are able to see how an algorithm uses data, or or in another way, how data is used by uh, automated decision making systems, which is super useful now that we are regulating AI both at the within the AI Act in the EU and the platform board directive but we want to know and this is why all our guests are here how did that happen so Claudio <laughs> tell us how did you make it happen please uh, thank you hi everybody I'm sorry for this uh, um, potential uh, um, inefficiency of the conversation because I'm not in my uh, usual location uh, Happened that uh, uh, back in time, uh, I was uh, studying uh, algorithm of uh, Facebook, YouTube, Amazon, and other platform. And uh, those kind of algorithms happen in the browser. Those kind of algorithms uh, can be studied uh, by doing A-B testing. So having different profiles, uh, performing action for you, and measuring uh, what is uh, returned to the users. Instead, uh, we also want to, we as uh, the tracking as well as the project, uh, want also to move in analyzing uh, uh, how algorithms have an impact uh, in uh, people's lives. And uh, so the gig economy or people uh, uh, which uh, their work is intermediated by an algorithm has become uh, one of our uh, targets. But uh, it was uh, far more difficult to uh, make those analysis because uh, you need to analyze the app and also because you cannot uh, create uh, synthetic behavior. Uh, you need to work with uh, actual accounts and those accounts belong to workers. Uh, you cannot uh, simulate uh, to buy product uh, and to deliver them because it's not something that uh, can be easily simulated. So the uh, methodology uh, that we developed uh, for uh, social media platform were heavily different from uh, what uh, we have to find in uh, um, for the gig economy. Now. Sorry, um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, there is a slide I shared uh, with the E2I that uh, can talk about uh, our timeline. And I want to comment uh, on some uh, key points and the different uh, findings and research uh, we made. Can it be shared? Yes, we will share it in a second. Maria, maybe can you help me on this, please? I'm afraid I have not received the slides. Um, Claudio, okay, please. no problem. Uh, I can just uh, narrate it, but it's the slide number two of the of the link I shared before. Anyhow, uh, in 2019, uh, in, with the help uh, of uh, Stefano Rossetti of uh, Noib, we were trying uh, to use Article 22 of the GDPR. And to do that, we need to have evidence that uh, some automated decision has got uh, an impact in the life of a work. And uh, in order to collect uh, those uh, um, witnesses, we made a survey, a survey made uh, of many questions uh, with the goal to uh, isolate possible uh, misbehavior of a platform toward the work. Uh, that uh, has been an approach that uh, has not uh, produced uh, a, a usable result, uh, but uh, you can find it in the annex number one of the uh, report uh, published today, all the results and uh, all the answers, because they were quite insightful. But let's say it was not uh, easy to use uh, those uh, inputs 
because uh, um, after even a violation has been perceived by the worker, then it was difficult to actually link it to some uh, decision of the platform. It uh, was a, um, a different uh, approach that we started in uh, 2021 and uh, related to the uh, adoption authority actions was uh, to find uh, finally a rider eager to share with us the login and the password because in that way we can run uh, their application in a laboratory and start to uh, study what actually the application does when it is used by a worker. Perfect. This is the, um, is the slide. And uh, uh, yeah, it talks about uh, the, the timeline. Um, I'm talking now about uh, May 2021, when we found a courier willing to cooperate. Um, in July, we start to find the, the first uh, piece of evidence that uh, were uh, fascinating. Uh, we used the different methodology. Uh, the first was to disassemble uh, the, uh, the Android package. And, um, and to try to see if something uh, was insightful, which kind of uh, privileges are requested to the rider. Then uh, has been used uh, Frida. Frida is a tool that uh, um, allows you to observe how an app behaves. That's because an app run inside an operating system, like uh, uh, Glovo Courier ride, uh, runs inside of uh, Android. And when the global courier want to access to some uh, um, peripherics, for example, want to access to the GPS or want to access to the microphone, then this is requested to the operating system. So Frida allow us to monitor every time the app want to access to those resources. Because uh, when you install the app, you know that uh, this app will access to your location, but you don't know when it happened. Instead, with this tool, we were able to monitor it. And then we just installed the, um, let's say, all the traffic was intercepted through a tool named the MITM proxy. And uh, in this way, we can actually observe which information were sent from the app to the outside and to whom. Uh, the important piece of evidence, no, no, uh, please, the only slide that matters is this one. Uh, the, um, the, the piece of evidence that uh, were uh, worth is that uh, uh, through third parties, so other companies that were not declared inside of the privacy policy and uh, were not present in any contract signed by the rider, those parties were receiving uh, private information about uh, the worker. So uh, yes, login and, login and, uh, and ID, uh, pictures, but especially GPS location. So where this person is. And that was happening when the app was open, not when uh, actually a shift was uh, was executed. So not when the worker was working, but to, when the worker has the app open. And that uh, imply was outside of the working shift. And uh, um, everything was uh, sent, and that uh, was seeming to us uh, like a lack of uh, minimization. Uh, another aspect is that uh, the uh, global infrastructure was uh, pinging the application and asking for the rider location and uh, getting uh, their presence if they were available. And that's again uh, even outside of the uh, shift. Uh, and then it was also by studying uh, the uh, digital traffic, you are also realizing that uh, certain information like uh, a score that was not an excellent score, but was an additional scoring was present. I see that uh, it was not the excellent score because uh, the excellent score was present in a different place. And so that's a start to make you suspect that uh, there is an additional uh, way to rank uh, riders. And again, you see that uh, some of those uh, uh, evidence can be helpful to enforce uh, the lack of uh, privacy of the app. Other evidence can be interesting for a labor union because uh, uh, the, the presence of scoring is something that uh, sometimes is thought in uh, the uh, collective bargain and uh, is agreed that uh, this should not happen. But then uh, when you inspect uh, what happened behind the scene, you find it. So what uh, I believe is that uh, those, uh, um, uh, those tests uh, somehow can legitimize reverse engineering and try to see that uh, if uh, you want to really understand the power dynamics in the modern uh, gear economy, you need uh, to be able to inspect and understand what's happened behind the scene. 
and uh, those evidence they can be helpful or for labor union to better haggle in the interest of the worker or for authorities that can better direct how those kind of business need to be uh, developed or also for policymakers and other uh, researchers that can understand uh, which kind of power dynamics really happen. Like one of the questions I don't have yet uh, answered is uh, those third parties that uh, were getting the private data from the riders, were they paid by Glovo to offer some analytics or they were actually paying Glovo because uh, the value of those data was insightful uh, Sorry, I'm back. I'm back, but uh, I was just asking this question, like, uh, how are the power dynamics when third parties process personal data and they can use this data to make some benefit and uh, get some insight? Are they actually paying for this data or they're paid because of their, uh, some analytics back? So those are the kind of questions I would like uh, uh, labor union in the future ask because it's part of mapping the power dynamics of the system. I, uh, uh, let's finish this uh, timeline quickly. Happened that uh, we made uh, this uh, test other three times and uh, uh, we bring uh, those evidence to the production authority. But uh, the first time, no, no, please. Uh, the only slide that matter is the previous. Thank you. I'm uh, talking about uh, February and September, 2022. We, uh, take again evidence and what we saw is that uh, the uh, apparent violation they were keep being present. Even if Glovo change uh, their app every week or sometimes every two weeks, but let's say there is a, a very frequent update of the, of the application, the violation they were ever present. Uh, that's the make use aspect that is really part of the design it was not a mistake. Initially, we gave this evidence to a data production authority, but uh, uh, this uh, um, application, this submission arrived too late, and so it was difficult for the authority to validate uh, those data, and also because uh, we tried to make a legal case out of it. Instead, that was an approach that uh, has not uh, paid uh, back. We tried uh, in July to just uh, make a technical analysis, and again, we saw all the violations present again after two years. We only made a technical submission without any kind of uh, legal assessment. And this technical uh, submission was uh, more helpful for them because they just had uh, some technical evidence to validate. And uh, uh, that is the uh, investigation path or the litigation we made with the authorities. Meanwhile, this uh, report has been published. The report talks uh, uh, till the analysis of September 22. And after the report has been published, it has been also uh, seen uh, by uh, some labor union in Italy. And uh, related or unrelated, uh, there was a strike uh, last week in Milan with the riders asking for algorithm transparency. And, uh, and that is the story of this investigation. What we want to do in the future is uh, keep offering support to labor union or other groups because uh, uh, those kind of technical skills need to be uh, much more uh, accessible. And uh, there are many degrees of investigation that can be done. Tell me, Claudio, Thank shall you. I move your slides forward or have you finished? No, no, you can uh, close it. It was just this timeline I want to show. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Claudio. Is um, I will uh, before uh, opening the the door the the yeah the Q and A for questions to to be put in the chat. I would like to ask uh, you and Joanna a couple of questions. But the audience, please uh, write down the questions in the Q and A so that uh, uh, Claudio and Joanna can answer them uh, in the time that we have. But first, um, Joanna. Can you tell us why is this case relevant to non-platform work as well? Well, it clearly algorithmic management systems are not going to stop at platform work and they're already proliferating beyond platforms. 
But platform workers, we are the pioneers in uncovering the logic. And the logic is to collect lots of data, process it, and use it to evaluate and then control workers. And this logic is spreading in many sectors already. And it applies to very diverse professionals, including care workers or university professors. So really, I don't think any sector will be spared from algorithmic management systems unless we collectively uh, oppose it. Um, and yes, sometimes it looks like apps, and this is what we were talking about today, but it could look like uh, smartwatches, but it can be just basic everyday software like Zoom or Microsoft 365 uh, that we have on our work computers. And I think that it's, this importance of the study is to really change this um, narrative about the black boxes um, and the opaque nature of algorithmic management systems. Because I think that, yes, it's a challenge that these uh, companies are very intransparent about whether automated decision-making system is even installed in the workplace. And if it is, then what does it do? But I think we sometimes assume and maybe assume incorrectly, although I don't know, that's the part of the problem, that these systems are smart. I think that actually we can assume that the systems that um, are used by platform are much more basic. They, I don't think they necessarily use machine learning or language model processing. I think these are much simpler algorithms that we're talking about. But yes, the important thing is that we, we don't know what is the role of humans in implementing these systems, and we don't know, uh, we cannot look inside. And uh, even companies sometimes say, you know, we don't know uh, what happens inside these things. So I think we, if we accept this narrative about the black boxes, it's really easy to get uh, defeatist about the possibilities of research or effective enforcement. So what we propose with our study is to say that the, the problem is not the black box, but the problem is also the data that is used as input for these black boxes. And, and that is actually much easier to uncover. In this case, we used a simple technical method to uncover that uh, these uh, automated decision-making systems are using location and even during private time of workers. But sometimes no technical method is e needed to uh, uncover what inputs uh, are collected. For example, workers know that it's uh, their biometric data, that their pulse is measured, or you know there's a facial recognition used. Um, you know, we, we, we're getting reports that there are software now that monitor emotions in the facial expressions or in the tone of voice. I think these are very clear red lines for inputs that um, that it's just going too far. Like, I mean, I don't think it's our body that should be monitored by our uh, employer. It could be used maybe in medicine, but not at the workplace. And another thing, and this is why the study is interesting, is that we can look at the outputs of automated decision-making systems. And again, in platform work or in workplace in general, it's easy to see um, for what purpose is the data collected, right? So is it to optimize a service to make the delivery faster? Or is it to share with marketing companies and collect this data into some profiles that will be sold to advertiser? Or, um, and this is where workers will care most about actually data uh, collection and automated decision making is if it's used for the purpose of uh, controlling and monitoring and rewarding and punishing um, the workers. So we know from the field work that uh, these uh, the automated decision making systems are used to promote, demote, workers fire them sometimes even discrimination and these are the kind of outputs of this of uh, of algorithmic management or ai that are sometimes quite easy or much easier to spot than than we think so i think that okay. very just yes. one yes. one thing <laughs> thank yeah. you Go go ahead, Joan. I didn't I didn't yes. explain this. I just, like, I just think about some 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 example from recent news. You know, everybody, all these uh, work uh, employers want workers to go back uh, to the office, and now um, now there 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 is 
uh, planning to penalize workers that want to work from home. You don't need a, a super smart technology to implement this. Uh, you just need a chip card, you know? So I think the way forward is to stop talking about the black boxers and talk about inputs and, and outputs, because then we can really talk about what that we need better evidence of what software is uh, out there. And uh, with that better evidence, we can also clarify the legal rules. All right, let's go for a question to, to Claudia. Thank you, Joanna. Claudia, for a mo more technical perspective, you used a series of uh, reverse engineering techniques. Can you please just briefly, briefly mention them? And um, two questions. Can these reverse engineering techniques be used or replicated in other automated decision-making systems? Um, outside the platform economy, perhaps in another sectors. And uh, more specifically, you carried out an investigation, a technical investigation in one worker's app. A uh, question here is, can you assume that the experience of this person, of this writer, represent a lot of global workers in Italy or maybe in other countries, uh, particularly Spain or across the EU? What is your feeling or your thoughts? Uh, well, starting to the first, uh, um, other kind of automated decision making indeed can be analyzed, but uh, uh, there are uh, two possible uh, tendencies that can be um, seen. One is that uh, um, those techniques became much more affordable and usable, and so other uh, institutions that uh, need to keep uh, technology to account will be also ready to keep them accountable. Uh, for example, uh, something like the U.S. Consumer Reporter uh, that in Europe uh, is a um, consumer association. Uh, they are some institution that uh, uh, need to do some form of analysis. Sometimes it's black box, sometimes uh, they do reverse engineering when they cannot really um, study only the input and the output. Uh, so that is going to happen, but uh, what we also saw is that uh, the uh, most wealthy company invest uh, in making those analyses harder. They adopt uh, obfuscation technique, mechanism that uh, uh, make it tougher any kind of inspection. And uh, somehow, uh, if uh, the technical defense is what the companies are adopting, and uh, at the maximum extreme, you can see the Volkswagen scandal no? when uh, you hide inside of a code something that only is expected to behave differently than when it's in production. In that case, we are going toward that sort of technocracy. And in that case, only policy that enforces transparency and force the power for third parties to audit and scrutinize the system, we can have an actual transparency. In the other, imagine that those techniques start to be much more adopted by civil society, then we can think that all the apps are, uh, can be seen as a long tail. So the majority of the app is used by small amount of uh, worker or users because they help you in your daily life, but uh, it's a local kind of uh, need that uh, make you use that app. And very few instead uh, are uh, European monopolist or worldwide monopolist uh, of app. And only those very wealthy are going to invest in obfuscation, while all the other are not. And uh, perhaps, uh, by inspecting all those uh, lesser popular uh, apps, we can uh, try to influence more the culture and uh, what developers should do, how uh, an app should process data personal, uh, personal data properly. And uh, uh, those are, let's say, more low hanging fruit that can be uh, addressed. In that case, uh, the mass engineering is, is already um, showing that uh, there is a mystery of personal data. Also, Aida, uh, we also may test in other kind of uh, um, app, not just global, but uh, we saw similar behavior also in other platforms. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go back to Joanna now. Uh, Joanna, um, well, this, this report is very useful for not only for regulators, <laughs> I hope that they are going to read it a bit, but also for your community, the research community, our community, and for trade unions themselves, those who are in the field. So what are the lessons? How can we use this further? What is your, your idea behind it? Well, one thing that I want to talk about is that, of course, we can use this strategically in enforcement. 
uh, anything that helps to uncover how AI system works can be helpful in enforcing existing regulations, finding out the gaps where it doesn't work and trying to figure out what new legislation is needed. But because I, we don't have so much time, I want to today, uh, because everybody's talking about regulations and, and, and that, I want to talk about what can we do with, uh, we don't have to wait for new laws and institutions to act to improve the situation as it is. What we need is, uh, what we need is research, of course, we need funding for technical research to existing AI systems, but um, we can also partic all participate in this research, no matter where we work, we can help out. We are all data subjects and we can contribute to this shift of thinking that you know AI is something there. AI is here, and you know let's all start with a little audit of our phone and think about what apps uh, you have on your phone and can it be problematic? Maybe um, maybe there is an app that is from a smaller vendor that you think is violating your privacy. Um, maybe you can submit uh, using the GDPR, uh, G GDPR rights, uh, the request to that company, just sending an email mentioning GDPR to ask for your personal data. Um, you might find out what your company knows about you, uh, but most importantly, if, uh, if uh, you think that they're going too far, you can submit a complaint to the Data Protection Authority. Um, just, you just on that. Uh, explain to us how can that happen because um, it's interesting to have that possibility for trade unions for any individual actually to submit that type of uh, signal to the DPA. Um, can you tell us more a little bit about this because unions are perhaps not used to doing that and yes. uh, maybe it's a little bit fear a little bit of a fear maybe the fact that it's in an anonymized basis can help um, just give us some couple of thoughts about that. Um, that's why I say trust the try it out first as a as just a consumer you know if you order order food from Volt uh, then send that email and see how Volt will react but as a union yes of course uh, what you can do is uh, you the traditional way is to find um, a writer or a worker somebody who would qualify as a uh, data subject and that person would submit uh, an individual request uh, an individual complaint but workers representatives have special rights so you can submit it as in Italy as signalazione just as just you know uh, you're a general concerned actor an activist or an NGO but as a union you can also submit uh, submit evidence what we found out through this case which is the most important learning is that when you submit uh, a complaint to the data protection authority you don't need to know the law you don't need to have very uh, internalized you know principle of data minimization principle of fairness transparency that is not what they need all they need is evidence and this evidence can be screenshots this evidence can be you know a video of a, uh, of how the system works in real uh, time of course it's if you have access and this is what we're hoping to to technical experts we're hoping that with this our uh, with this report with our new task force called reversing works we can connect connect more technical experts with either directly with workers or with unions. So the better the evidence, the better chances you have that the DPA will take a look at it. But from our experience, what we hear from DPAs is they really don't need much. Um, and yes, there is a difference if you submit this uh, request as a interested party, uh, as a union or as a data subject, as a, if you submit it as a data subject in your uh, workers' rights were violated, then you will be informed by the DPA about how the proceeding goes. But anybody, really anybody can submit evidence um, to the DPA and might trigger investigation just like the one that we, we are talking about. That's great. That's very an important, uh, that's a great important lenses for everybody, really. And uh, we need some evidence, some sort of evidence, whatever it's technical or not, uh, everything works. And I want to link this to another question by Filippo Bordoni to Claudio. So um, why, why did the DPA really decided to conduct an inside inspection of the architecture and the softwares of the company? And uh, a question related to the DPA resources. 
How um, are the IT experts or the A experts in the Data Protection Authority in Italy have the ability to conduct such a similar investigation that you did? Did they kind of uh, uh, check what your, your technical evidence and the tests that you carried out? What did they do with the evidence that you submitted, Claudio? Uh, thank you, Ida. Uh, I believe that both of the questions uh, can be answered by what is their power? So why they uh, make an inspection in their office? Uh, why they can ask how the infrastructure works? Is their power to ask and to be present to do inspections? But they're an uh, administrative uh, kind of uh, uh, public body. So they don't, they don't have uh, many other investigatory power. And uh, uh, one of the realization of our uh, approach is that uh, in the moment uh, we log in as a writer to make the application execute, uh, that is something that uh, the Library Show Authority cannot replicate because uh, they cannot uh, pretend to be someone else. It's part of uh, um, their limitation of powers as uh, administrative uh, institutions. Um, so what uh, they could have done uh, was uh, verify that uh, our uh, evidence uh, were actually matching uh, with what Glovo has. And that is uh, how uh, they can be validated. Uh, I try to offer uh, to show the mechanism used by us uh, so eventually it can be replicated, but the, uh, the issue is not that they don't know it. They know those kinds of techniques, just that they cannot pretend to be someone else. They can, for example, use the same of techniques for an app that is freely accessible, but not for something that requires a dedicated Claudio, please come back to us. <laughs> Joanna, let's wait to Claudio for Claudio to connect. Um, okay, here is go. Here's come continue, Claudio. You were gone for a second. Hey, but I don't know where uh, till where you hear me. <laughs> because uh, what was the issue? Um, continue with the, the just continue. Has, uh, continue skill. with what you were explaining. Okay, okay. The, the authority has the technical skill to do those kind of analysis, but uh, uh, not the legitimacy to uh, pretend to be a rider. Instead, uh, uh, we as an uh, NGO or a civil society that uh, is more free. Uh, can do this analysis in support of the rider with their consent that are giving us login and password so we can uh, test how the app behaves toward them. Um, I guess that's answer to all the question. Yes, I think so. Um, I would like to pull out another question from the public here, uh, from John Tennyson from Unison. It's a trade union in the UK. And he asks to you, Claudio, I think, but Joanna, you can also uh, pitch in. Do you have any other examples of where workers have been able to use employer gather information in this way? Oh, you have gather information in this way. Uh, yes, um, I hear uh, that uh, Prasalita Uzaio, in uh, collaboration with the uh, uh, Worker Info Exchange, were uh, using a, a data subject access request to request their data and to uh, observe if the data that uh, they get back is actually consistent uh, with the data that they have. And, uh, and that's can be used also to do some more long-term kind of analysis uh, of the app behavior. Uh, but I, those are data obtained through, um, through your rights. Instead, uh, in our case, we obtained the data through technical analysis. Many, many right. other- I think, uh, I think there are many, many places in Europe right now that are trying to obtain data of workers and analyze it and submit it to data protection authorities or courts. I think the only thing that is different, our thing is that we didn't ask anybody to give us the data. We tried to get it without a uh, company's involvement, company's permission, of course, a fully legal method, but still uh, the other method is based on you using your legal rights to request data from company and trend try, trying to analyze that. And of course, Worker Info Exchange has pioneered this method, but there's also 
personal data IO in Switzerland. There are uh, people in the US uh, in, in the US also experimenting with uh, with different um, ways of uh, obtaining the data and analyzing it. But that's a bit, that's slightly different because then you're relying on what the company gives you, right? We need to develop. This is not the, the method that we're talking about today. Is not the only way of trying to reverse engineer. The, the, the key thing for research going forward is how do we use the fact that we have an app or a piece of software and then we can inspect the code, we can inspect the interact the way it interacts with our div devices and the information it sends over the network to deduce, to sort of, you know, deduce what is happening. We will never see fully what's happening. But maybe there are more methods, and this would be exciting also for us to discover beyond what we what we tried out. What are these methods? This is where the research we think should go. And we would be very excited to collaborate with other researchers that would like to test other methods uh, of reverse engineering or black box testing. But these new methods that don't rely on the company giving you anything, or they don't even have to know that you're conducting this kind of algorithmic auditing. And the worker knowing that there is a way to see through the black box. I think, Joanna, you made a point really right before research for the research community, but we also in this um, AI talk were speaking to many trade unions who might not have a research community close to them or who are less, um, let's say, <laughs> they don't know what to do so this is a way to tell them that it is possible to see through the black box and at the end of the day as someone said here it's not really black uh because it's full of lots of data and data that sometimes it's ours or it comes from from the from them as a worker here i would like to ask another question about um yes michael antonsen is there anywhere is there anywhere you can see which apps, for example, the mobile phone apps you already know are sending data to a company you are employed? Is there any way that an individual can know that uh, what data is being collected or what data is being processed from the apps that that individual uses on a mobile phone? Um, yes, I, as I was uh, suggesting in the chat, uh, and there is the tool from Privacy International that helps you to intercept the traffic that an app is sending outside. Uh, uh, those tools exist. What uh, is uh, complex sometimes is uh, automate those kind of analysis. The analysis we made was very artisanal, very manual. It required to check uh, uh, between a lot of evidence and decide what was worthy, what was not, and uh, uh, use different tools. But uh, if it's only about uh, intercepted traffic, the tools developed by Paris International help to do that and uh, is a, a starting point for uh, one for an investigation, for example. Yeah. And I wanted to also tie this point to what you said about unions. How can unions do this? Of course, we would hope that uh, unions have a legal expert uh, and a technical expert. Just, you know, that uh, every union has a maybe even a, tech, a technical team. But actually, even if they don't, unions have a very important role to play. Because there, for this study, we needed one participating writer. How do you how do you find that participating writer? How do you find that worker that is already interested in enforcing workers' rights? Well, these are the wor the workers that are members of unions or that are already working with unions. The unions are critical for us technical researchers or people interested in strategic enforcement to identify cases, workers, cases where privacy and data protection might be violated and workers that would be willing to participate in this kind of research. They are the, they are the ones that can help to build these corporations and to establish trust between workers and technical experts. And that is uh, often the key obstacle to overcome in organizing this kind of research. So unions can, um, can be really helpful because they listen to workers. They know what their concerns are. So we have to also listen to unions to know where to go next. And do you think that it's advisable for platform related uh, workers or for trade unions dealing with platform work to develop their own apps or should they instead collectively oppose algorithmic management? Shane Shoshana asks here. That's well, for you, Joanna. 
I think we have to ask ourselves if we want uh, platforms to exist or not, but in a world where they do exist, then we should be much more forceful about uh, implementing existing new existing laws. And I think the platform directive is also um, a good place to, you know, increase the regulation of these uh, platforms. I think. So should... do you think that this piece of evidence will change the course of negotiations at the platform board directive three log? I, 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 so far I see uh, that there's actually a very little interest in algorithmic management uh, on the EU level and the negotiations that are happening right now have been centered more about the presumption of employment. Or the, the AI Act. The AI Act also unfortunately is disappointing for me um, in terms of uh, the way that I would address the workplace. I. I am I'm I'm a big fan of these top down initiatives from the EU uh, also on new better laws on national levels but I think we really have to figure out how to use better existing tools so for example oblige companies to do data protection impact assessments before we oblige them to do fundamental rights impact assessments you know what I mean we we haven't we have we have to develop a lot of legal practices, unions, activists, uh, data protection authorities to, to fill these laws with meaning instead of just talking about new laws in this abstract way. I mean, I am a fan of top-down EU legislation also because in some places like Poland, where I come from, this is the only way that uh, laws move forward. Transposition is always an opportunity. Transposition from uh, of EU law to national law is always an opportunity to for for innovative law that helps workers uh, but yes uh, our our study is more about using existing softwares and existing laws as as a way forward okay and uh, maybe a question from Claudio this is from Isabella Bileta what could transparency look like <laughs> after you have carried out your investigation what's your understanding of transparency thank you uh... For me, transparency, the way that it should be implemented is that uh, every time uh, you have an order or something, if peak you as a rider, you can understand why that happened. Uh, the idea that uh, we can avoid entirely algorithmic management is a bit uh, impossible. For me, algorithm will need to be seen as, uh, as policy, policy embedded in software. Just at the moment, we accept that uh, those policies are a business policy and they are secret. But because they impact our life, impact our city and our business, they need to be treated as a public policy. A, a transparency means that you know what are the criteria to make the algorithm in that way. You know which are the inputs, the, the data that are considered by this machine, and you can expect that actually uh, the algorithm is uh, working well and if you cannot, you can appeal in some way. But what uh, concretely, if you were a writer, what can you do? Where do you find this information? But what, what do you do? Not exist. But for example, I hope that uh, a future app uh, of, for writer can have a dedicated panel where uh, if a system is evaluating, if it give you an order or not, and you get uh, uh, skipped, you understand why. Maybe you were too far from the place where you should have been, or maybe you took too long before and now you have to rest, or maybe you are punished. Uh, we don't know. So, sometimes uh, uh, you have an uh, explanation that uh, the system, the business has uh, that are not given to you. If, for example, you are working uh, too many hours, uh, then uh, uh, you need to be uh, stay on, uh, on, on rest, or, uh, or you can keep working more because you are very efficient. Th those are, are the reason behind an algorithm. We have no idea on uh, what is implemented at the moment. Uh, and uh, if those kind of elements became part of the public discussion, that at least can inform more the riders uh, and also understand what is fair, what is not uh, for them. All right, I think we are almost close to, to, to the, the end of this webinar. Claudio and Joanna, would you like to share some final thoughts before we, we actually close? Well, I, I'm very excited about uh, the fact that the report generated a lot of interest because for us, it's a signal that there is a lot of room for the, not only this kind of research, but for connecting 
uh, you know, technical experts in, in unions and maybe workers directly. And when we want to play uh, an active role in, in doing that. So please uh, do get in touch with us in case you, you're interested in this topic. Uh, our idea, our hope would be that we can, you know, train people in this method and there would be this kind of teams like ours uh, all around the world that would be replicating these studies and uncovering more and more um, cases and more and more violations and working closely with public authorities. And that would uh, clarify the existing rules and help strengthen the enforcements for what is to come when these systems get actually smarter. Claudio? Oh, I echo the wishes of uh, Joanna with this project, uh, reversing.works. Uh, we try to uh, make a replicable our analysis and to train people. Uh, we spent many years uh, to uh, learn uh, the wrong path. And uh, that's why uh, we hope that uh, future investigation will be much more uh, quicker and efficient and uh, mapping out exactly which are the actors that uh, can uh, use us uh, and uh, which are the institutions that can take our output to change the system. Because uh, let's uh, repeat, investigation of this kind are only emergency measures. They should not be seen as the solution in the long term. They are meant to show a problem and then policy and better technology should solve this problem. Right. Uh, and that's all for me. Yes, thank you, Claudio. And from the ETUI perspective, I really want to bring more technical evidence on reverse engineering or other types of techniques that bring this evidence uh, not only to DPAs, data protection authorities, but to labor inspectors also. They should also be a little bit more acquaintance of what is happening behind the apps. And of course, to regulators and to other uh, research and trade union uh, audiences. So that brings us to the end of today's episode. A hearty thanks to you, uh, Joanna and Claudio, for being with us and to you, the audience. We hope that you have found today's episode interesting. Thank you for tuning into our AI talks at ETUI. See you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.